Hi, it's Jeff. As we stay at home here in the first week of April, we're still in the early stages of the COVID-19 outbreak with a frustratingly uncertain near future. We'll get through it, but I know it's scary for a lot of folks. So, for what it's worth, I wish you and your loved ones peace of mind and good health. I'm glad you're listening today and hope it takes your mind off things for a while. On today's podcast, I'm featuring two more wineries who attended this year's Zinfandel Advocates and Producers Zinfandel Experience in San Francisco, Zaps Zinex. Although you are sheltering in place, you can join me now, virtually, on the wine road. Let's go. There's so many different regions of California that are producing amazing Zinfandel, the Sierra Foothills, Paso Robles, Mendocino, and then of course us here in Dry Creek Valley. So it'll be really interesting to see and meet all the other all the other members. Our Zin is definitely on the lighter side. I'm trying to do that on purpose. It's really important to me that our Zin, along with other varieties that we're making, are 100% true to the variety. So any Zin you ever have for Berryessa Gap will always be 100%. She's Nicole Solengo of Berryessa Gap Vineyards, located in Yolo County, which just happens to be the next county east of Napa County. She produces a good number of wines in addition to Zinfandel. We'll hear from her later. I'll start with one of the many Italian families who grow Zinfandel, much like Robert Biale from my last podcast. This time I talk with the Ramazzatis. Now that's a good Italian name, huh? I traveled to the small town of Geyserville in Sonoma County and met up with the incredibly friendly Joe and Norma Ramazzotti and their son Travis in their tasting room. They're right next door to Diavola Pizzeria, and it didn't take long for us to decide to do the interview there. I thought it was fitting. There were people conversing, enjoying pizza, drinking wine, just like a crowded Italian family dining table. I agree. Yeah, this is perfect. And the food here is wonderful, too. So the pizza goes perfect with the wine. Thank you for bringing the wine over. And we're going to have a little pizza here in a little bit after the interview. Tell me about, uh, you know, one region in Italy I'm not familiar with is La Marca. Uh, La Marca is um, right on the Adriatic seaside. And uh, the main grape there that's very popular is Verdicchio, Verdicchio de Castelli de Iesi. And right now I'm trying to find cuttings to put some in for ourselves and stuff. So uh, I'd love to grow it here in the, in the United States in California. And that's where your father emigrated from uh, back in 1958? Exactly. And I, I actually, I was born in Italy and came over when I was eight years old with the family and stuff. Okay. And we were luck, so lucky. My aunt had a pruning grape branch out on Dry Creek. And uh, when I got here, we had to start picking prunes. I had never seen a prune in my life. But there we were picking prunes. So, <laughs> How old were you then? Eight. Yeah, those... Family businesses, they get you started early, don't 25 you? 25 cents a box. Oh, at least they paid you. <laughs> and I love the term that uh, you use on your website, and they use, I guess, in Italy is la terra, right? Uh, like terroir in yes. French, same yes, kind of thing. Exactly. Uh, what, what the land has to offer the earth and its gifts, and mm-hmm. you uh, certainly appreciate what, what that is. We started from the beginning, you know, growing the grapes and stuff. So, and again, everything had to come from the dirt and the, the, the land. So, um, that's where this all started for me and stuff. So, your father was also winemaking in Italy before we came over? Uh, no, actually, he was. He worked for the railroad. He was a welder for the railroad in Italy, and which was a good job in Italy. And uh, but when he got here, he had to learn a, a lot himself how to do. Uh, operate the equipment because he never drove in Italy. He rode a bicycle everywhere there. <laughs> and, uh, of course, he had to learn all about the vineyards and grapes and stuff. And But uh, he had a good teacher here when we got here. All these old Italians in Dry Creek really helped my dad out and stuff. So, Yeah, you could, you could throw a rock in this area, both toward Dry Creek and also Alexander Valley, and hit an Italian pretty easily. Oh, yeah, no, they were all over the place. <laughs> well, Italian-Swiss colony certainly brought many to this area. Uh, quite a few. Uh, in fact, uh, my dad did he, a few jobs for Italian Swiss Colony, some welding jobs for him and stuff at the time. And because he, you, you never made any money in prunes, so you had to do some off, off, ranch work and stuff. So, did he know uh, the Sagacios back then? I imagine he did. He knew the Sagacios very well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just did a story recently on them, and I think it was uh, Ed's father who had quite a history. At, Italian Swiss colony. Yes, yes, he did. And I've got to know the Sagacious very well, the whole family myself. I yeah. Imagine, yeah. Yeah. I used to sell them grapes, actually. So, okay. mm-hmm. yeah, you got into the business about what, 1975? 
Um, I started with the old vineyard uh, in 75, but then when I first got out of college, then um, um, I went and did some other things and got really got back into it in 1982. That's when I moved back from Santa Rosa. I lived in Santa Rosa for a while, and then moved back, got back into the business in 1982, and then from then on, all we did was farm and stuff. So, but eventually, you finally got into winemaking. Huh? Well, again, 2000, 2001, um, I couldn't sell the grapes after all these years with uh, so many wineries, 10, 15 years of being with them. Uh, they did, the contracts came up, and they I, they didn't renew them. So then I was stuck with all this grape and didn't know what to do with it. So I started the little winery. We started small, but every year it grew and grew and grew. And, but now, you know, we're, we're back into the real selling. I still sell to almost 18 different wineries, what little I make, about between 400 and 500 tons a year. Great. Yeah, you, uh, you said you manage about, what's it, uh, 120, 120 acres. Yeah. We have two long-term leases still, and then the rest is management. So about 80, 80 acres in leases and about um, 60 in management, 40 in management. The winery started doing well, and Travis came back, and uh, it's, uh, our tasting room has been our savior, really. Um, 75% of our sales of wine comes from that tasting room and our club membership. And then uh, he's gotten into a bunch of restaurants, so about 25%. And so we're only in between the tasting room and restaurants. We're not in any store or anything like that. Uh, how many cases are you doing now? It's about 5,000 cases a year. Yeah. That's respectable. I mean, it's still boutique, but uh, gosh, there's so many out there who are just doing like 2,000. Yeah. So. If you saw it stacked in a warehouse, you'd say, how in the hell are we ever going to sell all this wine? <laughs> you think that every year, don't you? Every year. <laughs> Thank goodness Travis is here to help out. Absolutely. Huh? <laughs> so you're getting out there and uh, pounding the pavement, huh? Yeah, I mean, the, the restaurant and wholesale business is, is pretty competitive, obviously, in this area. So we, we found a pretty good niche with these some of these uh, boutique Italian varieties that we make that really are, especially with restaurants and bar-style restaurants that are very uh, food-friendly, very soft, so you can really pair them with or without food. And people seem to respond very well with them. So we're in about 45 to 50 restaurants in between Cloverdale and the and the Marin area at any given time. So with we usually wholesale. We we have typically out of the tasting room we have about 12 different SKUs, 12 different wines that we make, and we wholesale about six to seven of those, kind of depending on each individual restaurant, what their needs are, what their how their menu pairs. So yeah, each each individual restaurant has its own tasting and menu. Well, Italian wines certainly uh, do make good restaurant uh, wines, and it goes well with food. And why don't you give me a list of uh, the wines that you are crafting? Oh, God, as far as, as, far as our whites, we do. Uh, as far, our one Italian variety of white is our Pinot Grigio. Very unique style Pinot Grigio, quite a bit darker than, pi- than people are typically used to. Instead of being so clean and crisp, actually more of these green pear, green apple notes, and more, much more creamy mid-palate mouthfeel. Very unique style. Then we make a uh, really nice um, Alexander Valley Sauvignon Blanc. Not so citric and grassy, much more of the uh, honeysuckle and melon flavor. So again, a very unique style uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Then we have our Chardonnay, which really is still, even though we make these unique varieties, still the king of our white wines. A uh, little partial malolactic, but really clean and crisp, all neutral oak barrel fermented. Again, very unique style. Then our rosé, we uh, stayed very local with our Zinf- uh, 100% Zinfandel rosé. Half and half Saunye bleed off Zinfandel rosé. So you get that nice, clean, crisp acidity, but also this beautiful, beautiful uh, wild strawberry. So it really makes a very... Uh, very nice pairing for really spicy food so this is one of our most popular wines that we have here at Diavolo actually yeah your dad was saying it goes good over here with the pizza huh? it just pairs nicely with all their pizza dishes especially their house made uh, Calabrian spicy chili oil here really really pairs nicely with it then as far as our red wines go um, no Pinot Noirs we stay pretty true to our uh, to our area up here in Dry Creek uh, in Alexander Valley so no Pinot Noirs instead we specialize in our two uh, estate grown Italian varieties 100% Barbera, 100% Sangiovese. The Barbera, very small production, only about 100 to 150 cases a year. Sangiovese, a little bit more, 200 to 250 a year. But both, they grow on my parents' beautiful home estate out in Dry Creek facing west. So really steep hillside they grow on. Nice sun exposure, good hard rocky gravel soil. So these vines really struggle producing these very bright red cherry flavors, just, just how you'd find them in the regions in Italy. Yeah, I'm really enjoying the Sangiovese we brought over here today. And so... We don't have the pizza yet, but I'm looking forward to see how that, how that, uh, 
how that bears with the pizza. And uh, you have a Super Tuscan, too, one of my other favorites. So, the Super Tuscan blend, that's, God, when did you guys first make that? 2006 or seven? 2005. So, that's a Sangiovese-based Super Tuscan blend. The exact percentage of Sangiovese switches slightly year-to-year, but it's predominantly 60-65% Sangiovese with Cabernet, Merlot, Saron, Cab Franc. One of the, by the numbers, one of the drier, drier wines that we make, but really meant to be your Italian food dish pairing wine. A little bit drier, a little bit higher acid to really complement those red tomato sauce, uh, fatty pork, sauces, dishes. So, really complimentary food, food wine. And, of course, you have some Zinfandel. Of course, yeah. This being a, a Zap and Zinex featured uh, interview here. So we do make uh, we do make two uh, red Zinfandel red wines, one from Alexander Valley, one from Dry Creek. The Alexander Valley being 100% single vineyard Alexander Valley Zin. But, again, very stays very true to our style, very light and fruity. It's not such a high alcohol bomb. It's got this uh, beautiful wild cherry notes to it and just a little subtle white pepper on the nose. So it's got that nice spice people like, but... Really, a very soft Zinfandel. And then the, uh, the other, the Dry Creek Zinfandel, that's truly our flagship wine. So what this is, is a co-fermented Zinfandel blend. So this is the old Dry Creek field blend, co-fermented blend of the old Dry Creek Italians. 75 to 76% Zinfandel picked with Petit Syrah, Carignan, Alicante Boucher, and an old Swiss white variety called Chasse's Doré. All that gets all picked together, crushed together, fermented together. Very unique style, very, uh, actually a pretty famous blend of this region here in Dry Creek and Alexander Valley. Now, what does that uh, white Swiss variety bring to the mix? So, the old the Italians would always throw in this white grape in with the Zinfandel because actually, molecularly, that white grape actually draws more color out of those Zinfandel skins. So, it was, Zinfandel is always typically such a light, kind of colorless variety. That's That goes along with the Petit Syrah and the Carignan, some of these heavier, darker varieties, especially the Alicante, to really darken up that light Zinfandel. I guess it's kind of similar in a way to the uh, uh, Viognier and the Syrah, yes, exactly, you know. Exactly, but but exactly. from what I under- I thought was uh, that was more for the aroma and perfuminess of. Well, Viognier is very aromatic and perf- perfumey, so that was the reason for the Viognier. Uh, the Chasse's Doré is such an incredible variety. I wish we, I wish more people could see it. It's just this huge. It almost looks like a white table grape. And we've got about uh, 25 to 30 of those plants in my grandmother's tomato garden. That's where we, <laughs> that's where we get our our Chasse's Doré. I was going to ask where you get those from, but it's in your mom's garden, huh? Well, I saved uh, I saved a few vines, and then I've been making my own vines from them, and they're actually common stock, so we lose a couple every year or so, but I keep replanting. I make more, and um, we're planning on planting a little bit more of it. I've only, I'm only getting about 400 pounds, and I, I need probably a little bit more to go in with that record dome. So, so yeah. the name of that blend we call Ricordo, which in Italian is I remember, or actually it's a, a memory in Italian, in, in remembrance and in homage to my grandfather and the old Italians who used to make this in their, in their basements as home winemakers. Right. And on that note, I'm going to have to remember Golden Chasselis, or Chasselis Dore, even Chasselis Blanc, a variety new to me. As I often do, I ask Travis, the third-generation Ramazzotti to live in Sonoma County and second-generation family member at the winery, if he feels a bit of pressure to keep the family business on track. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's a it's a very competitive market. I mean, you see, you get to. I, I'm out every day looking at uh, everybody's different wines, and there's just so many people out there making making amazing wines. So it's a t- it's a difficult task. How do you differentiate yourself? How do you find your niche? Um, how do you make your wines different yet good and that people want to keep coming back? And it's all, it's all marketing and packaging and how people, people experience your wines in your tasting room. The tasting room is truly the biggest from what I've learned and what I've, what I've got to uh, experience. People's environments in their tasting room and what they experience, the people in there, that's what they remember. The wines just kind of complement that experience. So, yeah, this is um, mentioning the family. This is a true family business, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we're a pretty small production between uh, between my father and I, my mother working in the tasting room and the in the vineyards and the winery. My my aunt Marie works in the tasting room with us. We have one uh, one employee, Lisa. She's amazing. She's pretty much family now. And then two uh, two gentlemen that work in our tasting in our winery with us. Uh, Matt Johnson, our master seller, and then Andy D'Agostino is our chemist and we all all four of us make all the wines together it really is a really team team project whenever whenever we do any blends or any winemaking we do make all decisions together 
I also understand you have another couple that are helping you out, and uh, no surprise, they're Italian. Mel and Patty, of course, uh, about four years ago, we were really struggling to make it all go. And I met Mel at a restaurant at Biot Bocci, and we hit it off right away. And um, I, I told him, he says, he loved my wine. He said, you need a partner in this business? And I just happened and say, oh, yeah, sure. And he goes, the next day, here he comes. He says, I want to be involved. Wow. And it, after that, it's been the same. They're wonderful. They're from Stockton. And uh, they've been just great partners from then on. They, they, they let me do everything I want to do, but yet they want to be involved. And they've been the best partners I've, a guy could ever have. Their last name is Rato, so it's a good Italian name. It is. It is a good Italian name. Mel was involved in construction in, in, uh, in the Stockton area in the Central Valley for years. And that's where he did his business. And, and, but now he's retired and he wants to be involved in the wine business. And how lucky are we? Yeah, sounds like a guardian angel was sent to you. A guardian angel was sent to me. <laughs> so, Travis, you're telling me uh, you're new to ZAP, the Zinfandel Advocates and Producers, and um, obviously this year you're going to be heading down to uh, the Zinex 2020 at the end of the month, and um, I'm sure you're looking forward to that. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, they've, they've been hyping it up pretty good. It's, it's ZAP's most, uh, most popular event throughout the year. They do have the Zinex uh, in New York as well, but this seems to be their, their primo, premier, event, premier event. So, yeah, they, they've been getting us pretty excited for it. And uh, so I'm going to actually be participating in their Thursday event, which is the media and trade show tasting. And then also, of course, the, uh, my father and I will be doing the grand tasting on Saturday the 1st. Saturday the 1st, yeah. That is uh, quite a Zinfandel fest. I mean, true to the name, it is just an incredible festival there. And uh, a lot of people attend and love to uh, try the great number of Zinfandels we have in the area. Yeah, no, it'll be interesting to see. I hope uh, I'm glad there's two of us there so I get a chance to walk around and see all, meet all the other members and see really... All the, there's so many different regions of California that are producing amazing Zinfandel. The Sierra Foothills, Paso Robles, Mendocino, and then, of course, us here in Dry Creek Valley. So it'll be really interesting to see and meet all the other, all the other members. You were telling me earlier that the, the organization um, of ZAP uh, is very helpful to you as a Zinfandel and Italian heritage grower. Correct. Yeah, they... Uh, I've only just three months being a part of their uh, being a part of their group, and they've really they've really put a lot of resources at my disposal, put a lot of connections at my hands, and have been very helpful in getting me introduced to a lot of the right people, and really trying to help push our brand and the expansion of Zinfandel to people who who are interested. Yeah, it's been great. So, Joe, is your real name Giuseppe too, or is it is Giuseppe? Okay. <laughs> well, Giuseppe and Travis, it was a pleasure sitting here with you, and I think it's time to order some pizza and move on with the day. Absolutely, and thank you. This has been wonderful. He was right. It was wonderful sitting with them, then eating pizza and drinking their wine. If you enjoyed listening to these second- and third-generation Italian immigrants, you can learn more about them and buy their wine at RamazzottiWines.com. Ramazzotti has one M, two Zs, and two Ts. I wish them well. When I get back from this break, we'll head over the Mayacamas Mountains, across Napa Valley, then through the Vaca Mountain Range into Yolo County, as we travel on the Wine Road. Now it's time for another Wine Uncorked. As we shelter in place, I've been happy to see the many restaurants and pubs and other entities who have taken advantage of loosened alcohol laws and started selling wine, beer, and liquor for off-premise consumption with curbside pickup and delivery. This past Wednesday, April 2nd, analytics firm Nielsen CGA released the second part of its COVID-19 on-premise impact report, which focused on consumer attitudes toward food and delivery, including alcohol preferences. According to the report, 15% of Americans are ordering alcohol with their takeout. My wife and I have done it, although it was the opposite scenario. We ordered takeout so we could have a beer and a glass of wine. <laughs> we didn't need the food. We found a little place open in Sausalito and took advantage of the situation. So what are Americans ordering? 60% have ordered red wine. 55% enjoyed imported beer. Craft beer was 51%. White wine came in at 50%. Pre-made cocktails, 47%. 
43% of you ordered sparkling wine or champagne. I'm surprised that number is so low. 42% of you ordered domestic non-craft beer, like a Budweiser. And 37% of you enjoyed a neat spirit. Takeout sales were up 110% in the week ending March 28th, compared to the average week. Unfortunately, it's not making up for the loss of business. But I hope this opportunity to purchase alcohol with takeout continues to at least provide people with something that will keep them as happy as possible. Not that you need alcohol to be happy, although some people like the option. Hang in there any way you can. Welcome back. During that break, we arrived at Berryessa Gap Vineyards in Winters, California, east of Napa Valley. Nicole Salengo is the young winemaker who gets the chance to grow a good number of wine varieties, as well as one of her favorites, you guessed it, Zinfandel. Much like the Petaluma Gap in Sonoma County, the Berryessa Gap funnels cooling wind through the Vaca Mountain Range into Yolo County. Nicole will explain how it affects the good variety of grapes they grow. It was back in mid-January that my wife and I traveled over to that charming, small, historic town of Winters. Nicole was kind enough to take us to the top of their vineyard that offers a stunning view of the Berryessa Gap within the 360-degree perspective of the surrounding farmland and rolling hills. After returning to the winery and a tour of the production facility, Nicole and I sat down for the interview, and she starts off by explaining some of the rich history and contribution the Spanish Martinez family created in the region. Here in Winters, we have a long farming history, and the people that I work for, um, Dan and Corinne Martinez, along with Santiago Moreno, their farming started actually with Dan Martinez Sr., and he joined forces with Ernie Penanu in the 1960s, I believe the year, it was the late 60s, to uh, form a rootstock company called Martinez Orchards. Um, it's still family run and operated, but that's kind of the roots of our winery is it started with the rootstock business. And they worked with UC Davis and have supplied many of the renowned wineries in Napa and Sonoma. And they still work with UC Davis, um, so that's absolutely true. Also, you have quite a little history of how you got here. You were studying geology in college initially in poli sci, you said, and then uh, how did you end up here? I told my mom when I was eight I was going to move to California when I grew up, and I think I am a pretty determined person and maybe never forgot that goal. But I always spent a lot of time in nature uh, and found rocks interesting as a kid, basically. And I thought I wanted to be an environmental lawyer, so I studied environmental law in poli sci to start out with in college. And a couple years in, I just had taken a couple of geology courses, and that became my true passion. I just loved the topic, and I, there seemed to be a never-ending possibility of what you could learn there. And it was so practical and applicable. So all the cool geology was happening in California. So that was another reason that I wanted to move out here. And uh, last year in college, I got a job at a Belgian-style brewery in Cooperstown, New York, called Omegang. And I just kind of started learning about the fermentation science process and also started tasting a lot of good Belgian beers. And of which there are many. Oh, yes. And at the time, in the early 2000s, when I was graduating from college and reached legal drinking age, there weren't a lot of good wines out there. But when I graduated, I had an uncle and aunt that lived in Davis, and they said, when you graduate, you can come out and stay with us in California and see if you like it. So I did. I got on the plane. I'd never been here. I flew to Sacramento in December, and I, it was very flat. There was no beaches. Out there, yes. Yeah, there was no sunshine at the time. It rained for two months straight when I moved here. It was nothing of what I thought it was going to be, but... I stuck it out and, you know, eventually did discover wine. It was kind of a long process. I first worked. Well, of course, now as a winemaker, you must appreciate the rain. And uh, I saw that you worked at a European wine shop when you were in Davis. Oh, that's correct. I worked at a little European-style wine shop called Tuco's. It's no longer in business, but I was waiting on a lot of professors for viticulture and enology in UC Davis and a lot of wine aficionados and wine collectors and 
the owner there was a really passionate person and he taught me how to taste wine and thought that I had a great palate. I've always been able to smell real well, so I didn't know at the time that kind of translates to also being able to taste well. And he made me the wine buyer um, in pretty short order and I was just exposed to some really high quality, really interesting and various wines um, in my early 20s. And That certainly helped, I would imagine. Yes, it did, Jeff. Um, and it also brought me to working in my first production role. Uh, one of the people that would come in regularly for lunch was my first mentor. His name was Mark West, and he was uh, starting a winery in Davis. And he had, he previously was winemaker at Sainsbury and had done a lot of other winemaking and was very talented, very intelligent. So I kind of made the leap from wine buyer to assistant to the winemaker for three years. And he just taught me everything he knew about the wine business. So I was really lucky. And then you ended up getting um, some education at Davis in viticulture and enology. So that certainly helped as well. Oh, yes. Um, And I actually think the way that I came about it was perfect for me because I'm a hands-on type of learner. So here I was in the cellar, not you know, being exposed to all the elements, but not quite understanding the chemistry or the science behind it all. And only when I started taking classes at UC Davis through that winemaking certificate program was I able to apply the science to what I had been exposed to. So it worked out well. And afterwards, you have worked uh, in Napa, you were saying, and did some, uh, some cellar work around the region, even in New Zealand. Yeah. I just completed my 14th harvest in 19, and 2012, I thought I wanted to make the leap and go work in Napa, and my eventual goal was to be a winemaker, but I wasn't ready yet, so I wanted to get some cellar experience, and I was working at a high-end winery in Napa. And did you go from that experience and maybe some other experiences about that time to Puta Creek Winery, your first position? Uh, My first position was at Roman Drouet, 05 to 08. In 08 to 12, I was working part-time because we only produce maybe 800 to 1,000 cases a year. Um, So there's a small winery in Davis, really passionate grape grower um, and owner, Gene Glazer. Um, He was another good mentor. He had an exceptional palate and he kind of trusted me and put me out on my own. And that's where I kind of taught myself a lot in the cellar. Gene also thought that I would be much more suited for the sales position, and I disagreed with him, so I, you know, that kind of furthered my inspiration to want to become a winemaker. Right. With your personality, you were like, wait a minute, I'm going to show you that I can do it. Yeah, I don't, I don't like people telling me that I'm limited in any way, that's for sure. (laughs) (laughs) You know what, I don't expect you to do a very good interview either. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. I haven't done too many, so (laughs) we'll see. Boy, and, and so you're here now at Berryessa Gap, and you get, took us out into the, the vineyard, and that was nice. I appreciate you taking us out there, because a beautiful view of the peak of the vineyard toward the gap. You could see the gap, and uh, has that ancient oak tree, and yet rolling hills. It's, it's just beautiful up there, and I can see why you're fond of it, too, because as a geologist, you have some different soils there that you can see in the rocky soils. You're absolutely right on, Jeff. We have a lot of unique geology, uh, particularly at our vineyard site, the Cobal Ranch. It's approximately 60 acres planted um, from 2000 to 2002. And we got unique winds from the gap uh, to cool off the warm days. So we have great ripening, but cool nights. But from a geological standpoint, we're in the foothills of the coastal range, and there are many different soil types, um, alluvial, volcanic, metamorphic, sedimentary. There's all sorts of alluvial and sedimentary, the same thing. So my philosophy on soil types in the eventual flavors that you're getting in wine, the more the better. Yeah, she enjoyed kicking around the dirt and rocks in the vineyard while expressing her feelings about how the rocks and soil and clay contribute a compelling element to her wine. The more complexity you can have and the more factors, um, whether it's in the soil, your barrel selection, your yeast selection, your fermentation style, um, the more complexity you'll have in your, your final product. So we have that starting in the vineyard, and I try to practice that throughout the winemaking process. 
um, talking more about the geology, we also are we're on the edge of a um, subduction boundary. So that's why you have the coastal range there. Um, so you have a lot of uplifting and mountain building going on. But we're also on a transverse fault that's still active, moving to the north. So there's still geologic activity coming, going on. Pardon, and more. My theory there is you're still your roots and your vines are being exposed to more minerals and therefore flavors um, at any given time. Yeah, interesting that we were at the top of the hill there, which is a pretty pretty good height. Uh, you said at one point that was uh, an ancient riverbed, so s- certainly a lot of geological activity happening in this area, and it's, which is evident. Yeah, you're right. Um, and that also speaks to the fact that I am very excited to get to work with our particular vineyard site that is not on the valley floor. I, I do feel that the best quality grapes in this area are in the the hills so you get good drainage and good exposure to all the minerals in your soil and unique enough that uh, you can grow a lot of different varieties here and it's not a large vineyard remind me again how many acres uh 57 planted good size but not huge by Mm -hmm. any means um and how many different varieties we have six different white varieties and eight different reds quite a bit. Um, I find it exciting. I think some winemakers get to work with a couple of varieties. I get to work with many, many, and so it's, there's never a dull moment. Including Tempranillo, Grenache, um, Albarino, and so some cool climate uh, wines and varieties, as well as some warmer climate. Yes, you're right. Uh, With science and technology today, um, you know, this also relates to the rootstock and the advancements that's made in viticulture. We know that grapes are grown, I think, in all 50 states at this point in time. So, you know, unlike 30 years ago where that wasn't possible to make quality wine, it's very possible now. And because I have, you know, work for this family that has great access to high-quality plant material, right. uh, I, I feel very fortunate. That's a nice card to have in your back pocket. Pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, it gets pretty warm here, doesn't it? Is, is it warmer here even more so? And I think it is, from what you were saying earlier, than Napa Valley. But again, you have those much cooler nights. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll admit I spent all of my harvest time in Yolo County. Um, but, you know, just 10 miles to the west is the Napa border. Uh, but we are on the edge of the Central Valley, which is known to be really darn hot. Uh, but as we were talking about earlier, th- that gap, which is is probably 20 to 30 miles as the crow flies. Um, it looks real close, but, nice. but <clears throat> uh, we were just up there. It was windy, and we're down at the winery now, which is about a mile south and in the flatter valley floor area. No wind here, but during the growing season, we'll have over 100-degree temps near harvest time, but in the evening cools right off the winds are very strong sometimes over 40 miles per hour so it really affords and gives the grapes an opportunity to cool down and have a restful evening and a lot of people in sonoma county are very familiar with the petaluma gap that uh, does have quite a bit of an influence on on the grape growing and how the the grapes mature and and uh, which leads me to this question they just recently received their own aba distinction is Berryessa Gap, a potential ABA? I sure hope so, Jeff. Um, that's actually on a list for the winery and me personally. Uh, there's not a lot of grapes planted over here in western Yolo County, but there are 19 wineries um, from here to uh, Clarksburg, so it's a pretty big area. So I personally feel that... Uh, we need a kind of, not a sub-AVA, but I don't want the AVA to be all of Yolo County. There's a lot of different microclimates in this area. So we are currently in the application process. I am not sure what they will call it, but hopefully, you know, in calendar year 2020, we will have an AVA. Oh, that's soon. Yeah. Well, good luck. Yeah. You might want to talk to the people of the Petaluma Gap about how quickly that happens <laughs> you know, or not how slow that happens. Yep, bureaucratic red tape and paperwork is part of the industry. (laughs) 
Before meeting Nicole, I read that the two varietals near to her heart are Sauvignon Blanc and Zinfandel. Absolutely. Uh, I think that Sauvignon Blanc goes back to that Napa harvest. I remember one of my first days, you know, doing some vineyard sampling and tasting this mountain Sauvignon Blanc, and I had never tasted anything like that in my life, and I'll never forget that flavor. And I think that's what inspired me when I didn't get the job, the permanent position there, to move on to New Zealand because, you know, we know that in Marlboro, some of the best and most coveted Sauvignon Blancs are grown and produced there, so I wanted to learn for myself. And I do think that's one of our most popular whites that we're growing and producing over here. Um, I try to make a austere, low-alcohol, uh, bright acidity style that also has some melon and tropical notes in certain years, depending on where you're getting. But I love Sauvignon Blanc. I love aromatic whites because I also am very excited about the Albarino that we're making. And Verdejo. Oh, yeah. That's a Spanish white variety oh. that Berryessa Gap is responsible for getting that varietal name approved through the TTB. So that happened in 2013, my first year here. I think it was 2013. And... Uh, before then, if you're growing and producing Verdejo, you had to just call it white wine. So I think that's pretty cool. All right, definitely. And then Zin. Let's talk about Zin. Let's talk about Zinfandel. And didn't think I liked Zinfandel. You know, I came from a history of buying wine. Um, I'd also had the opportunity to make Zinfandel a couple times at other wineries I'd worked at before I came to Berryessa Gap. And I just, it wasn't for me. It didn't have the characteristics that spoke to me. You didn't like some of the spicy character of it? I don't know if I like that black pepper and that sometimes like cloying sweetness you get in some of the finishes and yeah and that really extracted form Um, and it wasn't until I I came here and we're working with Primitivo here um, it's a selection of Zinfandel so I find it to be a little more elegant uh, it tends to be even thinner skin, a little larger berry, a looser cluster. But the, pre- the original winemaker here, he, that was his favorite variety. Uh, and I have to say it's my favorite red variety we're making as well, much to my surprise. Wow. Yeah, because you're making some wonderful reds. You didn't mention Barbera and Malbec. And... Oh, yeah, Malbec is a really delicious, really <laughs> special one. We also do Derif, which is a little unique. It's 100%. Uh, Petite Syrah, yeah. that's from a steep hillside vineyard block, so that has a lot of concentration and dark color. Uh, Tempranillo, you can't forget about our Spanish heritage, so our Tempranillo is pretty awesome. But Zinfandel is still my favorite. It kind of hits all the marks for me, where we make an aromatic style, um, not too heavy body, not too high alcohol, great with food, but also great standalone and well, tell, tell me about uh, the blending process that you went through with us earlier, and we got to taste the, f- the three different styles that you put together as one. We did just have a fun opportunity of doing some barrel sampling of our 18 Zin. 18 was a pretty amazing growing season uh, for us over here in winters, and that year, as every year that I've been here, uh, we pick the Zinfandel block in three picks. It's always the first red to come in, and I, my reason for picking it earlier is to get a lower sugar. I try not to go over 25 bricks, and you're, we're also maintaining acidity, so I'm not, I don't want to add acid to any of our wines. So I'll pick first few rows at the top of the block, which is in a rolling hill area, lots of big boulders that I find add some minerality and creaminess to that variety. I'll pick the first four rows, Zinfandel 1, right around the first week in September, and that block, or that lot rather, tends to have some herbal characteristics. I get some green tea, I get some eucalyptus. Not strong, um, but it's a component to complexity in the final wine. Uh, I also press that wine a little harder in our traditional basket press because I'm trying to get some heavy tannin out of this smaller sublot that will go into the eventual blend. Zinfandel 2 is kind of the bulk of that blend, and I, we do small lot fermentation. 
one ton fermenters, whole berry. So there's a little carbonic maceration going on. Uh, I'll do a pretty long cold soak. We do punch downs three times a day and a kind of soft press. So we don't have a lot of tannin in that, uh, that Zin 2. And then Zin 3 is really awesome. And I'll give away my secret. We do this really cool fermentation technique called submerged cap. It's a technique that I have heard is used a lot in Pinot Noir winemaking. And our Zin is kind of made more in a Pinot Noir style rather than that traditional Zin style that you've seen over the last 20 years. So we have stainless steel screens that we've fabricated and we put them over our one ton fermenters and we don't mix the wine. It's an anaerobic style fermentation and we're not really touching it. We're kind of just letting the skins be in constant contact with the juice while it's fermenting and you get some really beautiful aromatic and a really nice texture out of the final wine. I imagine there's a lot of activity going on in there too at the same time. You better believe it. (laughs) And interesting that you put all three together and I can imagine it makes a very unique and and complex Zinfandel, but on the lighter side. Yeah, our Zin is definitely on the lighter side. I'm trying to do that on purpose. It's really important to me that our Zin, along with other varieties that we're making, are 100% true to the variety. So any Zin you ever have for Berry Essegap will always be 100%. Uh, Zen. And uh, we're going to be pouring it at Zap on February 1st, which is my favorite event of the year. Uh, it's Zinex is the name that um, they're calling it these days, but we've been Zinex pouring at it. 2020. Yeah, Zinex 2020, pair 27. And I personally love going not only to exhibit our unique growing region and our Zin. Um, but I love tasting everyone else's Zin and seeing what they're doing and meeting all the other producers and getting to talk with them. I don't get out of the cellar that much, and that's one time in the year where I get to do that. It's really, really fun. You know, Zinfandel's having a hard time reaching the younger generation, and I think with your style, you might be able to reach them because they're looking for a lesser amount of alcohol and a, a little more restrained uh, wine, I think, these days, and you're appealing to that. I'm glad that you think that. Um, I found that in our tasting room. I, I actually was talking about this last week with a few of our tasting room staff, and they said the Zinfandel is extremely popular. Um, it's very approachable, very drinkable, doesn't have a high tannin content. And if you're just kind of newer to tasting wine, it's not overblown in any way. Um, like you are saying, it's not hot. It's not too concentrated. So it's approachable and a good intro to red wine. And that's good to hear because I know it's getting that reputation as being your dad's or your grandfather's wine. And then, you know, it's natural for the younger generation to try the other fun things, Malbec, and, and now that Tempranillo is becoming bigger over here and some of the Italian varieties, you know, it's and Albarinos and some of those. But don't forget about Zinfandel. It's, it's California's heritage grape. It certainly is. And we say that Zinfandel and Petit Syrah are California varieties, right? Um, they weren't... A, originally grown here but they certainly grow best here in my opinion so i think that's something important to remember we have such a great wine industry here and i'm proud to know that these grapes are our grapes here in california Uh, and talking about the italian variety barbera along with the zinfandel i find that those are our two varieties that are most popular with the younger crowd because of that juiciness, that lower tannin content, and that approachability. And I, you know, I found, uh, I think my wife will agree, that coming over here to winters and this uh, vineyard region, that it's well worth the drive to come over to Yolo County and, and try the wines that you're making here. And it looks like your tasting room here is a lot of fun, too. We have two tasting rooms, uh, and they both, you would get a very different experience at either one. Um, the one that we're at right now is on Highway 128, and this is where I make the wine. We share our facility with a brewery, and it's a very happening place on the weekend. Um, as of, I think it was the first of 2019, the state law changed where you can have both the beer and the wine on the same you know, premises. So people are outside, and maybe one person appreciates beer and the other person appreciates wine. Well, you could co-mingle. That wasn't the case when I first started here, and It was a little challenging to to make everyone happy. But, um, yeah, pretty happening. There's good food, good music. I hope you like the wine. We work real hard to make it 
And then the downtown tasting room is our original, more traditional style tasting room. And we're open six days a week and delicious wines being served there as well. And both of these facilities are kind of uh, older packing places, historic uh, properties, aren't they? Yeah, they both have a lot of character. Like I was saying before, I love making the wine in this building. It's an old fruit packing shed where a lot of hard work has been done over the years. And, you know, it's called Tufts Fruit Packing Shed. You know, we're filling rootstock orders. You have the brewery and the winery in this building. Historic downtown winners, if you haven't been there, you got to see it. Um, lots of great restaurants and our tasting rooms really beautiful. And I should also mention that it is a very popular spot for cyclists. You better believe it. This area is beautiful. So wherever you're riding your bike from, it's quite the destination. And uh, you'll be riding along orchards and just beautiful scenery all the way to winters. Well, lucky you, Nicole, for landing here, considering you're a girl from Vermont. And then think... <laughs> That's cool, too, being a girl from Vermont, right? <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> uh, a young gal with the mentality of an old hippie. I like that. Yeah, I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> hey, thanks for your time today, Nicole. It was a lot of fun. I am so happy that you came out here and took the time to talk with me. Thank you, Jeff. She mentioned earlier in the day that she has a hippie mentality, that is, loving nature, appreciating what the earth has to offer. She grows herbs, makes her own tea. She is a granola kind of gal. And find out more about Berryessa Gap Vineyards at berryessagap.com. Berry, like the fruit, then E-S-S-A, gap.com. I'm sure they would love for you to buy some wine online during this stay-in-place lifestyle we have now. My wife and I bought about five different varietals from them, so we sure enjoyed what Nicole is producing along with her talented crew. That brings us to the end of this road trip. Find more interviews and wine uncorked at onthewineroad.com. I haven't been too active lately, but I'm on Instagram and Twitter at JD Wine Road. If you listen to this podcast on iTunes, I'd appreciate you rating it with the amount of stars you feel that are appropriate. On the Wine Road podcast is researched, written, voiced, and produced by me. It's a lot of work, but your companionship makes it all worthwhile as I travel on the wine road. Stay safe, keep your head down, and bottoms up. I'm Jeff Davis. 